All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Blake Morrow. You are listening to the Morning Edge webinar. I want to welcome you all, and um, I'm going to, uh, right now, I'm going to grab Chris Bayer. If you guys don't know who Chris is, he's uh, Brazil61 on Twitter. He uh, was um, did analysis with us for a good year uh, in the morning. He, he was basically uh, doing the same webinar that um, the time zone that uh, Paul Franco does, and I'm looking for Chris. Just uh, give me one second, and then I'm gonna. There he is. Hey, Chris. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Blake. How are you? Hey, good. Hey, good, good to have you here, Chris. Okay, now I'm gonna go get Mark. He should be here. Let me find him. There he is, and the one and only Mark Chandler. Mark, are you here? I'm here. Thanks a lot, Blake. Hey, good morning, Mark, and uh, Chris is here too with us. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Could be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, first of all, Mark, uh, once again, I want to uh, thank you so much for um, uh, spending time with us today. Uh, it's obviously very exciting times to be in the markets, um, very interesting times to be in the markets, and uh, really getting your take on what's happening and maybe you being able to, I hate to use, the, use your pun, but Maybe you making sense out of the market. If you guys have never been to Mark's, Mark Chandler's blog, it's Mark Making Sense. And that's also the name of your book. <laughs> so, it's a, um, it, it, yeah, it, to, totally. I love it. Um, but, you know, perhaps you can shed some light on uh, some of the recent actions in the, um, in the, the, the FX market and actually the, the markets in general regarding what's happened with central banks. But before you do that, um, do you mind uh, taking a few minutes and, and, and telling everybody about yourself, Mark? Oh, sure, Blake. I, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. In fact, I was uh, last week I just celebrated my 30th anniversary in the financial markets. I think my, my route, though, is not what you regard as a typical route, especially for a guy who's worked at a bank and hedge funds. My background really is, uh, I, I didn't take an economics class until graduate school. I studied political science, history, philosophy, religion. I had a master's degree in American history. And only did I, my second master's in international relations, I really began focusing directly on economics. For the most part, I got my economics from history. And that is to say, understanding the, uh, the economy as a subset of society, rather than what a lot of people I think on Wall Street do, they understand society as a subset of economics. So when I first get, begin my career, I'm on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange covering the currency futures and T-bill euro dollar futures uh, for a newswire. I found out that the markets actually reward people quickly for having an opinion. And so I was a, I was a horrible journalist because I'd always be putting my own opinion too much. I found a job as an analyst. And from there, it was just uh, sort of like one job after another, firing my boss every couple of years, whether they deserve it or not. And uh, spent most of my career now on Wall Street. I've been at Brown Brothers uh, for 10 years now. Brown Brothers, our client base, are only real money. So that is the uh, mutual funds, life insurance companies. Uh, so the, a lot of my commentary is really geared for the uh, an investor, a medium-term, longer-term investor, uh, with a uh, who's really interested in currencies, not for themselves as an asset class like you are, or like the traders are in general, but really as a fund manager who's buying currencies just to make a transaction and buy the underlying stocks and bonds. So my approach tends to be emphasizing uh, on a macro side, politics, macroeconomics. But I also respect, Blake, what you were just doing, uh, going over the charts. The technical analysis I find very important. So I have a big fundamental view. I still am bullish a dollar, but I have to respect the price action. I've traded enough in my career to appreciate that no matter how right you might be on the macroeconomics, it's really about risk management, it's about strategy, it's about discipline. And so I recognize that even in the long run, my bullish dollar view could be right, but in the near term, uh, I, I agree with what you were showing on the charts, and that is that the dollar seems to be a bit overextended here, but there still is not a clear sign that the dollar is bottomed. Right, um, and 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 um, and you know your approach, Mark, I think is, in my in my opinion, and the reason why I've uh, I've I've 
you know, um, asked you to be on, and unfortunately, Chris Bear was uh, great enough to make the introduction. Is I've had, I've had, I've respected your work for so many years, and I tell you, one of your your, your blog, um, uh, which is Mark Making Sense, is the or Mar is it Mar it's Mark Making Sense? It's the, um, in my opinion, is like one of the go-to blogs that I go to just if I want to get a good picture of what's happening in the in the markets and I think what you do is you paint a really great picture taking every facet in to the market so um, thank you so much for well first of all thank you for um, telling us a little bit about your history congratulations on 30 years 30 years uh, is is a long time to be in the financial markets and um, and I and I'm, I'm I'm at my 21st year so I'm looking forward to my 30th year uh, eventually as well so thank you for that um, uh, l let's let's talk a little bit about recent action in the market and 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 we can first start with maybe the BOJ and then talk about the ECB and then obviously the the Fed what had happened yesterday and Kind of the unintended consequences you're seeing in the in the equity markets at this point, but let's start with the BOJ. The BOJ just a few um, just a few weeks ago they introduced negative deposit rates. Now uh, it wasn't quite at the extent that that the that the Swiss National Bank has has gone, but it was um, you know probably more of a, a policy statement. How do you how do you interpret what had happened with the BOJ and what is happening right now? Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's a lot Go of ahead. stuff. I mean, the BOJ yeah. surprised everybody who I know. Uh, in a couple of days before they ended up going to negative interest rates, uh, BOJ Governor Kuroda was at Davos, and he said that he wasn't considering negative interest rates. And in my work, I tend to uh, take a policymaker's views seriously. I take them at face value. I think that they're not uh, trying to mislead the market. And so uh, that works 70 80 percent of the time. And occasionally there are these type of things where the BOJ says one thing and then does another thing. What I find most difficult to like try to get my head around is first still this whole idea of negative interest rates. How you can buy, uh, you, want, you want to save your money, and so you say, well, I'm going to buy a risk-free investment, so I'll buy a Japanese government bond. They charge you for it. Same thing in Germany, same thing in Switzerland. And that's one of the reasons why I still remain bullish the dollar. I mean, here's what happens. You have a bank, you have extra liquidity. You give it to the Federal Reserve, they pay you 50 basis points. The ECB takes 40 basis points from you. Right now, Japan takes 10 from you. The Swiss will take 75 basis points from you. So I think that in the long run, that's why I'm bullish the dollar. But what happened, I think, is that you know when we think about the markets, we often think about one set, one set of participants. But it's very complicated because there's a lot of different types of participants in the market. And I think that what happened was that when the Japanese cut interest rates, Surprise in the market, it basically triggered, it was in the middle of, but also exacerbated a risk off mode in the market. And what were people doing? Uh, I think that people were primarily, at the time, uh, short yen, long equities. Short yen, long risk assets in general. Right. And so when they see what the Bank of Japan did, it almost looked like a panic. The did, uh, Chris, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, did we lose Mark? They had to unwind these financial oh. positions where they use the yen as a funding currency or... I'm sorry? Can you, you still Wait, hear me? Yeah, we, we lost you for a second, but we, we've got you again. I, I, I don't know what had happened there. Just, Am I yeah. back on? Yeah, you're back on now. Sorry about that, Mark. I'm not too sure what yeah, happened there. I was just saying... Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm just sort of going over this the idea that... Uh, the yen isn't people. You know, the idea would be that people would be selling the yen because the BOJ uh, cut interest rates. But a countervailing influence was unwinding some of these financially engineered positions, like buying Japanese stocks and selling the selling the yen against it. A lot of these popular ETFs, for example. And so, in the short run, so for me, I have this underlying trend driven by the fundamentals, and around it is the noise uh, that takes place. And I think that the uh, and so for me, the underlying trend is still for a, a stronger dollar. I am concerned. I, I do see dollar yen going through those lows at 111. I have to respect the price action. I like the kind of levels that you were talking about, uh, 110, uh, 30 to 50 kind of area. Um, so uh, but the problem I think that we have is that monetary policy never really did what people think it does. Think about what was happening during the Fed's 
uh, QE. The Fed would, people would anticipate QE, the dollar would sell off. And many calls I made during the crisis was buying the dollar on the announcement of QE. And it, I think that out of the three announcements, I think it worked twice. When you could buy the dollar either on a QE announcement or on the day after. And the dollar would rally, partly because it was sort of like sell the rumor, buy the fact. So part of the, I think that was happening, say, with the ECB. But I also think that there's a lot of people in the market who think that monetary policy is exhausted. There's nothing else monetary policy can really do. Here we are at negative interest rates, and it's not really weight weighing on those currencies. Now that that's a great that's a great point, Mark. Um, and what what are your views about that too? And I'm sure Chris and I and Chris, feel free to jump in whenever you want. Um, Chris Bear. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Thanks. But I, but I, what what I was going to say here is um, I, I I think that that is a real big concern of the market, right? It's like what else can what what else can central bank bankers do? What, and what are your what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I mean, what else can central banks do? I, I don't think that we've exhausted monetary policy. And I mean, for me, for example, people say they're having the ECB cut, and maybe you just, if you just look at currency markets. You might say, yes, it's, it's not working. But if you look at the other markets, like corporate bonds, for example, uh, peripheral European sovereign bonds, you have, had, you have seen the markets respond to the ECB action in a, in a, in a way that the ECB probably anticipated or would like to have seen, unlike in the currency markets. So, so I, I won't want to just judge the currency markets as, or use the currency markets as a major or only judge of the effectiveness of monetary policy. I think yesterday when Yellen, uh, uh, the, sort of the, the cautiousness that Yellen expressed, it also produced a market response. I think it was pushing on a door that was already open. I mean, emerging market stocks have already been rallying since late January. Uh, the risk, I mean, you saw that strength in the Aussie and Kiwi and Canadian dollar really before the Fed's uh, sort of cautious tone yesterday and cutting the number of rate hikes they anticipate from four to two. So I do think monetary policy, there's still room for it. I don't think the central banks have lost credibility in that regard. You know, people say, well, the Fed keeps changing their views. And I say, yes, of course the Fed changes their views, but so does the market. You know, back in the middle of February when the global asset markets were still melting down as part of that first six weeks of the year, uh, as assets were melting down, I think that uh, you did see the, uh, the, the impact, I mean, of... Uh, Central banks since then, the markets have responded, emerging markets have rallied, risk assets have come back. And I think that uh, that's important as well. So in a big picture sense, I do think that, I do expect the Federal Reserve to raise rates in June. I think the Bank of Japan is going to have to ease rates further. I think that we're not, maybe, uh, maybe not really at the bottom yet of what the ECB is going to do. Uh, but things I think are looking better for the world, like high commodity prices, better emerging markets. I still think this is just a technical Largely technical, corrective bounce, but it looks like it's got some more life in it. Very good, um, Chris. Did you want to add, or do you have questions I, about? I, well, I I, um, I found what, what he was saying before that interesting, so that's why I didn't want to interrupt. But uh, just based on what he, uh, Mark just said, I wanted to ask you, Mark. So, so if, if if you're not feeling that they're losing credibility, the, the, do you feel that the degree, um, let's say, the amount of communication? Is 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 more the problem then? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, so I guess two issues here, Chris. One is, is is there as monetary policy that is is the, is central banks just pushing on a string, or could it be more like uh, I compare it to uh, myself? I have a headache, so I take two aspirins, and my headache doesn't go away 15 minutes later, so I take another two aspirins. It still doesn't go away a half hour later, so I take another two aspirins. And then I just like pass out. Did they, is it that the aspirins didn't work, or is it there's a lag effect and there's other countervailing influences? Uh, so um, I do think there's a communication issue. I think that the dot plots. You know, my understanding is something like this: the Fed adopted the dot plot to increase its transparency. It's an experiment that many Fed officials don't seem very happy with, but they don't know how to get rid of them. Uh, my suggestion to them was get rid of them, but give the market something in addition. And that would be a press conference after every Federal Reserve meeting, like the Bank of Japan has and the ECB has. The ECB, yeah. The way the Fed does it now, for example, there's no reason why the some people had thought before yesterday the Fed could raise rates in April. 
And the reason I think that's unlikely is that the Federal Reserve probably wants to put their own spin on it, and that is to guide the market in understanding what it does when it hikes rates, which means that it has to happen at a press conference. And it seems to me, uh, Yellow said it yesterday too, they could have the April meetings live, but what would happen? Uh, the Federal Reserve decides at 2 o'clock it's going to raise interest rates, and so it calls an emergency press conference. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound very kosher to me. It doesn't sound smooth. It doesn't sound very professional. So instead, I think that we should expect the rate hikes at the central bank meetings because communication is really important. I sort of thought that uh, you know when Draghi was speaking last week, initially the the euro was selling off. The the ECB delivered everything and plus some. I think the market had expected. And right. things were moving along the way the way we anticipate on a macro basis, and then it reversed. And it reversed, I think, Chris, because of what you're saying. When Draghi said, in effect, that we're out, we've done everything we can do on interest rate policy, the market took that to mean the end of monetary easing. Right. And you know, it's important that all cuts are not the same. The, mar the way the markets respond to the first cut in the sequence, a lot different than they'll respond to the last one. And so I think that Draghi's communication, I don't think he made it, I don't think it was an accident. I think he knew what he was saying. But I don't think he appreciated the consequences of it. So let me ask you this, Mark, because you bring up a great point. When, if 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 Draghi implied, uh, Mario Draghi implied that this is, you know, b basically all that uh, they can do with monetary policy, what's next? What where where do, where where do you go next? Is it? It, is it the central banks that start pointing the fingers at, at, at governments and saying there's got to be a structural or a fiscal reform? How, how does how does that where, where do you where, where, where do you go next? I mean, if if you're relying if you're the if you're the if you're the market and you're 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 relying on let's just say you know for for argument's sake you're relying on easy monetary policy, looser monetary policy for longer to help stabilize and increase asset prices. If central banks have you know, they, they admittedly you have run their course and they, they, they have no real options available left. Where, where to next, I guess, is my question. Yeah, so uh, I think it's interesting, I think, because in some ways, you know, the uh, uh, previously when we had under Bretton Woods before many, 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 of, uh, many of your listeners were probably trading, uh, the, uh, uh, it was a fixed exchange rate regime. And that, that fixed exchange rate under Bretton Woods made a discipline for governments. And once that gold standard, that dollar link Bretton Woods system collapsed, countries broke the discipline. And that's why we had the, the, uh, the high inflation, the large budget deficits of the 70s. Similarly, that zero interest rate bound acted as a discipline. But once it's been broken, it's been broken primarily in Europe and in Japan, that there goes a discipline. And we're not sure where the interest rates will bottom. But I, I, I hear you that uh, we, we Interest rates, how deeply negative they can go is we're probably seeing as deep as officials want to go, like in Switzerland, which passed on cutting rates today. Uh, minus, uh, their actually target is minus one, minus 125 to minus 25 basis points on three month LIBOR, and they aim for the center of that minus 75 basis points. The ECB says that, and this is what I think the important thing to remember is that monetary policy is not just about the price of money, interest rates. Monetary policy is also about the quantity of money, and increasingly uh, the size of the size and uh, composition of a central bank's balance sheet. So my sense is something like this: Draghi said, in effect, the way I took it was, we're all, we're practically out of room with interest rates, which, by the way, he said before, and of course he's cut since then. But what he was basically saying is that the next moves, if necessary, will come from the asset side. That is, like they not only do they announce buying corporate bonds investment grade corporate bonds, but there's other assets they can buy, like bank bonds, for example. But I think that the ECB is out of the picture now till at least June and probably even later than that. It, what they did is they basically threw uh, the, the kitchen sink. I think that was one of Ziggy's uh, cartoons. Is uh, yeah. uh, He threw the, threw the kitchen sink. And I think he did that, and I think that what that means is that they've sort of uh, uh, shot the load for the, uh, uh, for the time being. And it's going to take a lot more weak data, which might not be forthcoming, especially on the inflation side with oil prices and commodity prices firming up. Uh, but I think that there are other things that the ECB could do. But of course, I think ultimately you're right. And that is that Draghi is saying, listen, there's only so much the ECB can do. Governments need to have structural reforms. 
But on the positive side in Europe, because of the refugee issue, it looks like fiscal policies relaxed a little bit sort of on the margins. And it's also partly what the French said after their terrorist attack, that the security pact trumps the stability pact. And so you got a little bit of fiscal stimulus, the more monetary stimulus coming through. And so my, my general sense is something like this. The Eurozone growth, even at the best of times, is probably close to what it's doing right now, which is say one and a quarter to one and a half percent. Just like the U.S. growth now on a trend basis is probably close to two percent. So I don't think there's much more the ECB can do. And I kind of worry that central banks, I, I understand the logic of uh, worrying about deflation. It crushes creditors. Actually, excuse me, uh, yeah, crushes the creditors, uh, it, it's horrible for the economies, but what are we really talking about, say in the Eurozone, minus 0.2, minus 0.3, that seems to me to be another definition of price stability. Point, plus 0.2, plus 0.3, we'd say that's flat inflation. And so I, I think that they're really taking a lot of risks on monetary policy with negative interest rates just for the sake of fighting deflation, which doesn't seem to be to be all that problematic yet. Think about a country like Sweden, where, they, where they're pre pursuing negative interest rates, buying bonds, and the economy is growing by more than 3% a year, and they have a current account surplus. So I think Sweden's case would be a very obvious case of exaggerating the significance of deflation, and I worry that Europe might be doing the same thing. Okay, yeah, and, and, and now you you know you talk about deflation that doesn't seem to be too too much of an issue at this point. Um, but you know m maybe uh, maybe uh, Ben Bernanke's uh, 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 you know previous stance uh, was you know made such an impact on on current central bankers about wanting to make sure that 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 we don't you know fall into de the deflationary trap where you know Japan has found itself in for so many years. And and Mark, I I, I don't want to interrupt you. Um, just uh, and Mark, I'm sorry, Chris. I just want to let you guys know I, I I am aware, and I'm sure everybody everybody's you know talking about the dollar yen. Obviously, the BOJ is out there. They're not gonna they're not gonna say that they're they are. But you know we were below 110 and we ripped or uh, excuse me uh, below 111. We ripped up to 111.70. We did a hundred pip rally in the dollar yen. Obviously, it's the uh, it's obviously the the BOJ is you know sniffing around, checking rates, um, whether they're intervening or not. Who knows? But um, they are definitely active in the markets right now. Sorry about that, Mark. Let's let's continue on. I just needed to yeah, maybe I can just say like, some stuff about the uh, BOJ checking rates. You know, I yeah. find that uh, on the institutional side, we know that the Bank of Japan checks rates every day, and sure. the Federal Reserve is uh, they they take a they have like a Federal Reserve fixing. They'll take it around the noon price of the major currencies. They are talking to the markets, uh, market participants on a fairly regular basis. And so what it tells me really is uh, this pop-up back above the 111 area. And like we saw uh, back uh, in February, we dipped uh, not quite as much through 111, but we dipped below it and it came right back. And I think it tells me that the markets are nervous. And then we will see the dollar close, I think, uh, finish the U.S. session above 111 because I think that they are concerned, excuse me, above uh, yeah, 111 because I think the market would be concerned that the Japanese themselves would be uh, the sellers of yen. Uh, the Japanese take advantage of the yen strength to buy foreign assets. And that's the other remarkable thing. You know, and that's what I was saying before about how complicated market participation is. I had a note last week. Uh, maybe it was earlier, yeah, I think it was last week, about why, who would be buying negative yield in bonds in Japan? Well, it turns out that the, what we call the cross-currency swap basis, that is, if you have dollars, rather than sell the dollars, and you're an institutional, not a retail investor, but an institutional uh, portfolio manager, a hedge fund, you've got dollars, instead of selling the dollars and buying yen, you swap the dollars for yen. And the, that, 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 we call that the cross-currency swap basis. And that really rewards somebody uh, to, to do that trade, basically you're sell, you're in effect, swapping the high-yielding currency for a low-yielding currency. You get paid for that. You get paid very attractively for that. So attractively that if, when a client does that, when an institutional investor does that, they're right now locking in, in effect, about a 2.2% yield on a JGB, call it a five-year JGB. And so the reason that people can buy negative-yielding Japanese securities for dollar-based investors is because of this currency, the price discrepancy in the currency swap 
side of the business. And so that's a remarkable thing. The Japanese themselves, of course, are selling uh, yen and buying foreign bonds. Some foreigners, especially dollar-based investors, have been buying JGBs. And in fact, I want to say last week, the Ministry of Finance comes out with the data every Thursday. And last week, uh, foreigners bought almost a trillion yen worth of JGBs. Wow. So you really think about the complicated of the market. That, and this is when I worked at a hedge fund, I remember my, uh, my boss telling me that as, it, as much as you want to buy something, there's somebody else out there who has just as much conviction the other side of the trade. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say two things. Um, first, I, I just want to comment on, on, on what I'm seeing technically. Um, the, the previous weekly low on the USD JPY was uh, 110.97 uh, or so. Um, the, today, it undercut that low, and I believe it, it undercut that low right on S3, and I, I think that it's just a natural thing that happens in the market. That once those, uh, once that new low is made, that the 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 market will then bounce because all those people that um, uh, got short uh, USD JPY higher uh, have just gotten paid, and so that that that's what creates that natural reflexive bounce bounce, especially on, uh, in a highly technical pair. Like the uh, USD JPY, so that's what I see regarding that, and uh, you know, guys, you guys just commented on it, and I just wanted to mention that. Um, my other question was, I, I wanted to ask Mark if, if he, based on my question yesterday, th does he see that the, the the central banks, and if not the central banks, like uh, the the big uh, analyst houses, um, the degree of not easily discernible malinvestment in the system? And then I wanted to ask also regarding that um, the value skew that that gets um, put into the system based on that. So, and, and if you look at let's say the worst is Japan, the next worst is the the euro area, and the next would be the U.S. in the um, advanced economies. Um, I, I think this is just a, a rolling methodology, and, and I, I just I don't see how it gets resolved. It didn't. It, nothing's been resolved in Japan in the last 20 years, economically. Yeah, I'm very sympathetic to that, Chris. The idea that uh, and for me, I'm, I'm working on a book that'll probably come out late this year, and it's the idea that many people think that there is some problems with capitalism, and my friends on the political right or political left have some fix, some reform, tax this, reduce government here, some kind of fix to fix the to address the problems. But in my work. I, I begin with the idea that the biggest problems with capitalism grows out of its biggest strengths, and that is the huge amount of, of wealth it produces. In fact, in some ways, I think what you call the malinvestment is, the, is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a way that, to illustrate how society is choking on the wealth it's creating. So whether you call it malinvestment, redundant investment, uh, excess capacity, it seems to me that uh, that, that, and, and for, for like, I want to say people slightly to the left, I'd say they talk about uh, surplus production. Uh, Lawrence Summers talks about secular stagnation, as if public investment can solve the problem. I, I think that it's not, it's not a question of too much goods, but the too much goods itself is a symptom of too much capital. And we've had this problem before. This is a typical. I want to say going back to like the 19th century, is a a stream of thought, if you will, that argue that this is that the surplus capital issue is the most profound problem of capitalism, and that they've come up with different solutions. And I think that what's happened is that the Reagan Thatcher solution was instead of the U.S. and Anglo-American economies contributing to the world's surplus, let the U.S. and the U.K. and Anglo-American economies absorb the surplus capital, and that means running trade deficits, importing the world's savings. And we argued at the time that the U.S. is, the US is a good financial manager. We'll take other countries' money and sometimes reinvest it back in those same countries and do and get a decent return on it. I think that what the, the financial crisis showed is that maybe the U.S. and Anglo-Americans in general weren't as good financial managers of other people's money as they pretended. 
and that that Reagan-Thatcher model of dealing with the surplus has broken down. The U.S. current account deficit is half the size it was at its peak. And so I think that we're in a transition. We, ha we don't have a new model that replaced Reagan-Thatcher. And so in some ways, in my work, I compare this to the 70s. We had economic things like stagflation, that classical economics that was impossible to have. And Reagan and Thatcher were partly proposed as a solution to that late 70s problems. And now the Reagan Thatcher model is broken down. I think that uh, we're, we're left without, like a, it's almost like a ship without a rudder. And so I think that's part of the reason why we're having difficulty in the markets, why we're having difficulty for policymakers. We really we don't have the new paradigm. Oh boy, so, you really nailed it. That's beautiful. Uh, so the overabundance theory is in 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 in, in capital versus goods. Well, yeah, yeah. For me, Blake, well, I'm well, saying one, that, one of them. One of them. Yeah, I say that the, the labor, overabundance is labor that is every, <laughs> We got everything. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I would say that the, the fundamental problem is that the goods abundance reflects the surplus investment or surplus capital problem. So one is a cause and the other is a symptom. I think, yes, we have too many goods. And when I think about just the waste that we have, which is also an ideologically safe way to deal with the surplus. In the U.S., you buy a box of Cheerios, and inside the box is a cellophane bag. Makes sense if you have to stack them up on a shelf. But for environment, for production, uh, I'm told that in Israel, they just sell the cellophane bag full of Cheerios. Who needs a box? Think about Americans and the British, we threw away half of the bread that we produce. That, that's waste. But it's not just the waste of the bread, but it's the waste of the energy, the water, everything, that, the energy that it takes to ship the bread. So I, I think about this abundance, I think about these ideologically safe ways to get rid of it, which is waste, which is uh, marketing, which is, uh, uh, look what happens with mergers and acquisitions. One year, or one phase, companies buy each other up, next phase they unwind those M&A activities. One year, J Japanese are buying Rockefeller Center. A couple of years later, we buy it back from them. This juggling around of financial assets also is another way to destroy capital in an ideologically safe way. That's crazy. That's a that's a really this is an interesting topic, Mark. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions. And by the way, uh, for those of you that are just tuning in a little bit late. Or you're just tuning in now. Um, on, on with us to this morning is Mark Chandler from Brown Brothers Harriman. You can see him right here on to, to to the left of your screen. Then we have Chris Bear, uh, independent trader out of Brazil, uh, Brazil 61. Uh, he's all around fun on, guy. All around fun guy. That's right. Uh, and and um, if you have any questions for Mark, and I know some of you guys are already queued up some questions, feel free to ask him. Mark, do you mind if I, I take a couple questions from some of these uh, some of the viewers? No, good. I hope they're easy. Uh, they, they, yeah, Mark. What color hair do you really have? No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, okay. Uh, first question comes in uh, from Nick. He says, "Hey, Mark, do you think Draghi was just trying to put more pressure on the European politicians to act?" And and this is, by the way, Nick is a longtime listener of the Morning Edge. He is a he's a Brit, lives in Italy, um, and he he also says maybe Draghi was bluffing, overplaying his hand to pressure the politicians. And that that that's a comment from Nick in Italy. Yeah, no, I think that Nick is right. I think that the Draghi, I think, and the ECB seem to be very frustrated with the lack of structural reforms and the lack of, I mean, in, a, in essence, the Draghi says, listen, I'm trying to buy you guys some time so you can get your act together. And they just haven't gotten their act together. Partly it's a political problem. I mean, think about it. You've had elections in Spain, Ireland, and Slovakia. Uh, Spain was at the end of last year. They still haven't put together a government. And so you do have a fragmented governments, and which makes it harder to have these structural types of reforms. They're also unpopular. And uh, for example, in France, Hollande uh, and his uh, sort of center, uh, centrist uh, prime minister have now moved away from some of the labor reforms that they were talking about a couple months ago. So I, I, I think it's right that Draghi uh, says, "Listen, I'm going to do. I'm going to again, uh, as as you point out, like throw the throw the kitchen sink at it. But now we really need you, the governments, to." To do the right thing, and they're not doing it, and that's why I, I stay uh, fairly pessimistic about the outlook for Europe. For a longer-term view on Europe, I also concerned about what happens to Germ what happens to Europe when Merkel is no longer is the chancellor. She's up for election next year. You know, she uh, she took a little bit of a drubbing. Uh, her party took a drubbing in the uh, in the weekend elections. 
you know, there's right now, there's a, about a one in five chance, I think I've predicted the events market, that she does not survive this year. So I think we have to think about a post Europe, post Merkel Europe, and I think we also have to begin thinking about Draghi still in office for a few more years. He doesn't step down until 2019. But the, the ECB's QE and the other policies that he announced, the, the four year long term targeted repo operations, extend beyond his term. And I think we have to think about a post EC, post Draghi ECB. And who would be the most likely candidate? Who would be a candidate on, on everybody's short list? Uh, Germany's Weidmann. And everything that Draghi has said yes to, Weidmann has said no. So I do think that uh, Draghi is trying to exert more pressure on European governments, but there's not a lot of leverage he has on them. And I do think that we have to think in the longer term about the uh, about the changes that are going to take place in Europe after Merkel no longer is the chancellor and after Draghi steps down. So for me, in the, in the next couple of years, it's still this divergent story that's going to, even though it's frustrating on a day like today with the uh, dollar selling off so hard, uh, but I do think the dollar is still in an uptrend on this divergence idea. And then after that, say 2017, 2018, 2019, we'll have to be thinking about the politics in Europe. And that, of course, assumes that Trump is not elected in the U.S. Right, right. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's another. And we're not going to get into a political conversation today because we'll end up going around in circles. But uh, Patrick uh, qu uh, asks, are central banks' reflation policies, in essence, a shadow global rebalancing? Away, away from hyper-emerging market growth and labor arbitrage with debtor um, uh, DMs? If so, the jumpstart of um, DM uh, economies seems very weak compared to financial assets thrown at them. Yeah, so the idea, right, that the, uh, that, uh, the central banks have expanded their balance sheets by, uh, by hundreds of billions of dollars, right? The Fed is the Fed's balance sheet is say up 3.2 trillion dollars. Uh, ECB is accelerating. The Bank of Japan is accelerating, and yet the actual economic outcome seems to be pretty minimal. I just know. I just my my sense is that it's hard to demonstrate like the counterfactual. Uh, but if they if the governments if the central banks hadn't done this, would we would we be worse off? And I suspect we probably would be. Um, so I, I do think that we're in this tough time at the central bank. We don't have the uh, like an engine of growth, and so the central bank's keeping interest rates as low as possible. Uh, I think that there is, and this is what the Weidman and some of the critics of the ECB point out as well. And that is, it does seem to be a connection between fiscal policy and monetary policy. I'll give you the example that I've been using lately with our clients. Uh, last year, the U.S. government paid about 225 billion dollars of service to U.S. debt. 225 billion dollars. The largest holder of U.S. Treasuries is not China, it's not Japan, it's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve gets the interest from the federal government, right? Last year, the Federal Reserve paid back the federal government 100 billion dollars, roughly. So the net servicing costs on the U.S. on the U.S. debt, which is more than 60 percent of GDP, was only about 125 billion dollars. As, an, as a good American, I know that debt doesn't matter, but the debt servicing does. And that's why Japan's able to keep 220% debt to GDP. The debt servicing costs stay low. Central banks accumulating government bonds often give back some of those monies back to the federal governments, helping to lower uh, their own costs. So very interesting relationship between fiscal and monetary policy. I do think that there is the line gets blurry when you really think about QE and you think about the central banks giving back money to the federal governments. Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, a couple of people asked if this is recorded. I'm pretty sure Ziggy is recording right now. Steve Bielby might be recording as well. So probably a couple different outlets are. Uh, T Rex. Uh, yeah, we got we got everybody recording these webinars just to, to make sure that, uh, that people can review them again because there's a lot uh, that has been talked about today. Um, this comes from T-Rex. He goes, question for Mark. If government bonds are now at negative yields, does that change the world? Uh, how the world will view gold as an investment? Thanks. And, and I, you know, I think that's a great question, by the way, Mark. I'd like to just add on to that. Um, you know, by a lot of... Um, 
the, these negative rates, I think, is maybe one of the primary drivers at the moment, if not inflation, but you know, primary drivers of, of precious metals moving higher, where investors might be uh, seeking more of a, you know, more of a, you know, hard asset investment. I, your thoughts on that? I, I think it's a great question. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so too. I think that uh, first, I'd say that there does seem to be, especially on the in the retail community, a fascination with gold that I don't really see on the institutional level. Yes, I know central banks, uh, some central banks, especially in Asia, buying some gold. Uh, Russia often is building up its gold holdings. But generally speaking, I think about the people who are managing uh, your retirement money, my retirement money, typically they're not big holders of gold. Think about the different equity funds you might own or the bond funds you might own or even some of the commodity funds you might own. But I do think that part of the, for me, the uh, unrealized cost of holding gold is that it does not have a yield stream. And so when interest rates are low, then opportunity cost is low. Negative interest rates is, is, is horrible, but it makes gold look more attractive because the opportunity cost then, by having something that's not having a negative, you know, if, if they uh, doesn't have a yield stream, negative yielding bonds don't give you much of a yield stream either. So, uh, so I do think there's a relationship there, but I also think that gold is often acts like a like any other commodity. And so it's not coincidental today, for example, that iron ore is up, copper is up, zinc is up, commodities in general are up. Uh, I've been trying to write on gold uh, about once a month. Uh, up there. I think I caught the move up to uh, uh, 1,200. Uh, I can see 1,250, uh, but up at, the, up at much higher than here. And I, I'm not sure whether this is just momentum now. Uh, I, I do recognize that gold is... Uh, because of negative interest rates, because of the uncertainty about central bank policy, uh, people are more attracted to gold again and breaking out of some key levels. Uh, so, uh, uh, but as, a, as in the long term, in the big picture thing, are we going to go back on a gold standard? Probably not. Is gold a new monetary asset? Probably not. I don't. I mean, the Federal Reserve has most in the world. Uh, China is building up their holdings. Germany, I think, has the second most. But at the end of the day, gold is still probably more a commodity, more of a of a of a good that especially countries that have very weak banking systems. Uh, partly, uh, Chris, I think about what's going on in Brazil. I can understand why Brazilians want to hold some gold. Uh, culturally, uh, India, uh, Southeast Asia, where, where you have countries that have problematic problems with their banking system, I think there's where you have a more genuine demand for gold, and not just as a trading vehicle. That's a great, great response. Um, Crisos asks, uh, does Mark see that there, if there's any reasons for, for, for the stock markets to collapse as so many people are predicting? And, uh, you know, that you get, you, obviously, Mark, you, you, you hear it all, you know, a lot of the fear mongering and, and whatnot that, you know, and I, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, you know, the first six weeks of the year were horrible. You know, yeah. the, uh, I think about this, a, uh, our clients, an asset manager comes back first day from New Year's. And he's not, he or she is not mentally ready to go in and buy. They're going to watch things. Remember what happened that first week of the New Year, that Wednesday was Ascension Day in Europe, it was the holiday, and we had the U.S. jobs data. So you come back from the New Year's, and you're going to just try to get your feet back underneath you. First thing that happens, Nikkei gaps lower. Then the DAX gaps lower. Then the S&P gaps lower. And we fall pretty hard until the middle of February. February 11th, 12th area, and then we bounce back. It hasn't been quite six weeks, but it's just about, and and like the S&P 500 have essentially completely reversed their year's losses. I mean, maybe it's down one or two percent, which, by the way, in a presidential, in an eighth year of a presidential cycle, so second, last year of the second term, tends to be a troubling year for the stock market. I think uh, generally down four to say 10 percent or so. Uh, so uh, why? what happened? I mean, we, we bounced right back. I, I tend to think that a lot of it has to do with, uh, especially in the U.S. and increasingly in Europe and Japan, uh, when companies can buy back their stock. That seems to be, companies seem to be the biggest buyers of equities right now, not mutual funds, not our pension funds, but, but the businesses themselves. Uh, I think that the uh, central banks, sort of easing policy or like the Federal Reserve, uh, pulling back from how aggressive they thought they would be, I think all makes stock markets look more attractive uh, as, as, like a, as we also put savings. Right. Uh, but it does make me nervous. Uh, I mean, I think I was pretty bullish on the stock market. I anticipating 
I think this is something I, I follow from you as well, Blake. That, uh, that it's good that we have a strategy. We, we anticipate a strategy when we enter it. When we enter a trade, we have a bigger picture strategy. And I often ask myself, uh, like in uh, January and early February, what kind of bottom should we be looking for in the S&Ps? And I try to do what are helping other people do, Blake, and try to understand the psychology of the market. And I expected a W-shaped bottom for the S&Ps. We got that W-shaped bottom. It projects towards uh, 2100 on the S&Ps, the way I would measure it. And uh, I, I think that's still a reasonable target. It, it helps us. Uh, close that gap from the first of the year as well, uh, but I, 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 it scares me up here. I mean, my general, my own personal account. I'm about 50% cash right now, uh, at the upper end of what I think is the range. Whether we go up to 2100, 2130, uh, lightening up up here after buying down at the, down uh, on a W bottom seems to be a reasonable thing for my own personal account. Uh, but I don't really see the stock market as going much, much more. I mean, I don't see the stocks in general having a big year one way or the other. Right. Okay. And I'm just mapping that out for, 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 for folks at home. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate, uh, appreciate about you, Mark, is that you apply such common sense uh, from a macro and, and really just from a, you know, a, 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 you know, from a macro standpoint, but more from a common sense standpoint and pragmatic. And, and yet you take all of that and apply uh, a technical, you know, you cut you, you, a technical um, uh, analysis, but but more so, you you, you have your approach and and how you're looking for to time the markets um, to back up that view. And I and I think that's that's what makes you really good at what you do. And I'm sure Chris could probably uh, agree with that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. Mark, Mark I want to ask you something. Uh, how, how much of a degree do other, uh, I mean, respected people uh, influence your, your your viewpoint? So you take a guy like Jeff Dunlock, who, who um, put out a chart about two months or two months ago, uh, showing the difference between HYG and uh, the S and P, and how something had to kind of give. One of them was, uh, you know. Wrong, um, and, and does something like that from a guy at that at that level influence you, or are you try to just stick to your own knitting, your own point yeah, of view? You know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I I do read what other people are thinking, uh, and I do that uh, for the same reason. But I find that uh, uh, through my job, getting to talk to some of these uh, large institutional clients, partly one or two things happen. Either we, so we go into it assuming that we have different views. Their views either strengthen mine or weaken mine. And either way, I come out ahead. If it strengthens my views, I have more conviction. If it weakens my view, that's good. I want to do the right thing. I want to know the right thing. And so uh, I find interacting with other people to be very important. But on the other hand, uh, I find that uh, in my stuff that the uh, I, I don't want to get caught up too much in... Uh, I mean, I, I have a... View, I have a re I just don't have a view. I, I over the years, uh, the discipline of having a reason for the view, and if if those reasons, it's sort of like what they said to Keynes, right? They said, you know, he said one thing, and then you say something else, and Keynes says something to the effect that uh, when the facts change, he changes his mind. And I think that's the type of attitude we have to have in the market. I find that people who make money in the markets are not right more often. Uh, they're more disciplined about admitting when they're wrong, not too early, where they don't have any conviction. But not too late where they're being stubborn. And I think I think it's like a, a very fine balance. And I think it's it's more of an art, I think, than a science. And that's why I, I respect a lot of people uh, like yourself and Blake in the retail space who try to who appreciate the importance of that discipline. And and I try to tell this to young analysts that I hire from time to time. There's a lot worse things than being wrong. Being wrong is I mean, think of a baseball player. Right? We're getting ready for uh, American baseball to begin and a good baseball player gets three hits out of every ten at bats. That means they're wrong. Seven out of ten times, or maybe you want to go with the on base percentage, they're wrong five or six times out of ten. We have to do a bit better than that in the markets. But there's th there's worse things than being wrong, being too stubborn, not learning from our mistakes, being mean. I think a lot worse than being wrong. I'm I'm, I'm going to be wrong half the time, and uh, I think so. What? 
I think a lot of other people are. And secondly, getting being wrong, this is why I think it's uh, someone like uh, Warren Buffett once said about having to love your losers. You love your losers because once you're done with them, you're done with them. Now you've got a clean slate. And hopefully on a, each time you lose money, you, have a, you understand why you lost money. Great, wise words, Mark. Really, really, um, really. And then that's going to resonate with a lot of the traders here that think that, you know, you always have to be right or they have a hard time admitting that they're wrong. And I think, um, you know, you pointing that out is is, is very valuable. This question yeah, comes – oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just find it at a professional level too. If I go see a client, I say, listen, uh, you say, you know, for example, I can bullish the U.S. dollar. They say, what, what's happened? You know, the, the dollar, the euro – made its low against the U.S. dollar almost a year ago. What happened to your dollar? Deal? So if I tell a client, if I fight it, I say, no, I'm really right. Or if I just say, yes, I'm wrong, and here's why. It's, much more, it's about, it's about uh, a compelling story. It's about having conviction. It's about being authentic and being, uh, being like a, a credible. And credible, and anybody who's been in the markets more than a day knows that it's hard to make money. And that uh, it's, it's not like shooting fish in a barrel. And we are all going to be wrong a lot. And so it's how to limit the, the cost of being wrong. Right. That, 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 gosh, that makes sense. Um, I, I have a question about crude. Do you, do, you have a good, uh, do you have a good feeling about crude? Because uh, Nidish from Singapore has a question for you. Yeah, so I, I follow crude uh, partly because, of course, it affects the other markets. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, so shoot the question. Okay, um, what are your longer term views on crude? Do you think that OPEC will try to stabilize the markets or they will be short sighted with regards to current price levels and forget about freezing production? Also, is it subject to member states honestly following the freeze protocol? Um, that, that comes from Nidish in Singapore. Yes, oil, oil, what a fascinating market. I think this is another great market when you want to think about how politics and economics inter interact with each other. So, uh, big picture thing, yes, I, th I do think OPEC's trying to uh, get their act together. No, I don't think it's going to be very successful. I think that uh, a freeze, I mean, here's what happened, right? So, Saudis and Russians agree on a freeze if the Iranians do last month. That is, they made this announcement in February. What few people fully appreciate, and this is the way politics really works, before you are going to announce a freeze, what is, like, in game theory, what will you do? Boost production before you announce a freeze. And that is exactly what the Saudis and the Russians did in January. Knowing they were talking behind the scenes, knowing that a freeze was possible, they boosted their output in January. The reason why a freeze doesn't, isn't very convincing to me is that many of those OPEC countries are already producing their capacity. The Saudis might not be. There might be still some more scope for the Russians to increase output, though they're having their biggest output, the most output, since the end of the Soviet Union. So, so my general sense is that if politicians often give up something they don't already have. So they're giving up excess capacity they don't have. That is, they can't boost production even if they wanted to, many of them. But I think that we've got to be careful here. My sense would be that the biggest winners of a freeze in oil prices, a freeze in oil output, and higher prices are going to be the U.S. shale producers. While we're, they're cutting back on production right now, the two largest U.S. shale producers say that they're profitable now at $40 a barrel. A year ago, a year and a half ago, they were saying $60 a barrel. And so one of the things that make this, this shale boom possible in the U.S., besides cheap financing, has been U.S. innovativeness, these technologies, and they still are improving. The, the shale and the oil drilling with the horizontal wells, with the uh, refracking, re uh, new technologies continuously help push down the cost of U.S. output. And so I think it's going to be hard for, for OPEC to get a, an actual, uh, a meaningful cut in output. And as long as inventories are still going up, and so globally, inventories we still, say, estimating about one and a half to two million barrels more than we need per day. So oil inventories continue to build. Uh, the market is getting optimistic. But now this, this has become more of a technical market, moving above $4 a barrel for the, um, I'm looking at the May uh, WTI futures contract. It wouldn't surprise me to see us go to 45 to 50 dollars a barrel uh, before uh, before then these uh, reasonable cooler heads prevail and we get worried again that, uh, about rising output and rising inventories. All right, thanks, Mark. That's a great great answer, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think technology is just it's it's what's really um, 
it's it's really what what's going to put longer term pressure on crude. I mean, there's so many different things, but technology just from, you know, the consumer standpoint, then, you know, the, the frackers and, and you know, who's extracting, I think it's just really, really, um, there, there are points that we talk about here on the Morning Edge quite a bit. Uh, I got a couple question, last questions, um, at which this one could be a big one. Well, Andy asked, where's your longer term view of the euro, but I think you're, because you're a dollar bull, um, you know, you're, you, you what would you say there? Because I got a, a much more complex question coming up next. Yeah, sure. So I, I can answer that one uh, simply in one word, one uh, one short sentence. I think before this Obama dollar rally is over, the euro is going to go back down and test its historic lows, calling eighty two and a half to eighty five cents. I know okay. we're, we're moving the wrong way here today. We're here one thirteen, uh, but I, th I think that uh, that's where we're ending up to go. But it's going to be it's a, it's a long term, multi year view and. I say that the same thing we tell people about golf, right? We say, uh, what do we? What's the golf saying? Uh, 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 yeah, there's a lot of them. Put for do, live for show. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah, so it's a short term. It's, it's it's what happens today and tomorrow about the risk management. At the end of the day, the long term views are sexy. It's nice to talk about, but it's hard making money on those long term views when there's so much intraday volatility. So I have the long term view, too, like what we say about driving, right? Aim high in your steering. So I have a big picture of you, but yet I have to live day by day. And I have to. I can. I only eat what I catch. Right. Okay. Go Wait, ahead. Can I mention something about yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a really great point. Um, I, I remember all through t uh, 2010 and 2011 how stubborn the euro was. Um, you know, between 125 and um, 140. Yeah. And everybody's like, wait a second, this just doesn't make any sense. This just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. And then it, it eventually um, broke. Broke, the, broke the level and, and, and it's, it's finding a new level. So it wouldn't be any surprise to me um, just looking at, the, at a monthly chart to see what you, you're suggesting, Mark, uh, quite easily. Yeah, we just bounce around for a while before eventually cracking into new lows. Because there, there's so many. There, I'm, I'm sure there's so many reasons. Now, now this is a loaded question coming from Ben. I don't want to. I'm not going to read his entire question because we're out of time. But um, real quick, Mark, before we go, because Kip's already here. Kip, are you there? I am. Oh, good. Say say hello to Mark. <laughs> good morning, guys. Um, and Chris, sorry. Hi, Chris. Um, uh, what What are your views on? The cable and Brexit. Sorry, I hate to run in your time, but this is a really That's important okay. one. Go, go ahead and wrap up whatever you cover. Which guy? Yes, yeah, so I, I can make it quick for you. Uh, Brexit. Uh, the, the, the predicted that the events market I, I, I look at has roughly the same odds of the UK leaving the EU as Donald Trump being elected president of the United States, which is a little bit less than a one in three chance. Uh, so I, I, but I think that the uh, when you think about risk, oftentimes as investors, we think about some kind of value at risk models. But I think the risk when we think about these kind of things like UK leaving, it's a, the odds of it happening multiplied by the impact. And so the odds might not be all that high, but the impact is very large. Um, I know that uh, when I was in the UK recently, talked to the Economist, they asked me, I never get quoted in the Economist, and so I was kind of excited about it. They said to me, uh, so what happened if the UK leaves? I thought that 115 to 120 was term. And it turns out the way that the economists quoted me is they said uh, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, says this, and by the way, Mark Chandler agrees. So I felt like a little bit of a backhanded compliment to the Goldman Sachs. But the idea is that many people expect the pound to sell off hard on, a, on an exit. Some people are positioning for it by reducing the exposure uh, by either selling pounds or in the options market. I, I think that uh, Winston Churchill once said about the Americans, he said, you know, I always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted the other alternatives. And I suspect that the same thing could really be applied to the UK. I think they're going to look closely at it, but when push comes to shove, I think they'll end up staying in. But the impact either way is going to be serious. If, uh, if they stay in, if it looks like they're going to stay in, I, I anticipate they have to be priced in earlier and for Sterling to be able to participate more on the upside. I think that once we get past the, uh, the British vote at the end of J June, I think that the market is not fully pricing in the risk that the Bank of England raises rates late this year. The market push it out to late, uh, to the middle of next year. And I think we, I think the surprise could be a Bank of England rate hike late this year, assuming that they stay in the EU. All right. Well, Mark, 
I, I just want to say thank you so much. You are a scholar and a gentleman, and you have provided all the listeners here with so much to think about. Chris, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, if, if, if it wasn't for you, Mark and I would not be talking right now. So, um, oh, come on. They, thank you, thank you, both gentlemen and Mark Chandler. Please keep those blogs rolling. I can't tell you how they are, how important, and how much light they shed on the entire <coughs> currency and 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 market community. So thank you so much, both of you guys. Hey, thanks, Blake. I should just say, you know, that I tell my wife that I will leave the industry the first day I don't learn anything new. So I thank both you and Chris for helping extend my career. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. You've been so gracious. Um, you guys have a great day, uh, and and um, so and thank you so much for being here, Kip. I'm going to turn everything over to you. Thanks, and I, I second what you just said, Blake, to to Mark and Chris. I, I definitely uh, we we really appreciate everything, and you know your insight is just uh, so wonderful. It's great to 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 hear what you have to say. Thank you. It's it's amazing getting these types of viewpoints.